We're going to finish up with part four with Glenda's presentation, and we'll be discussing the foundations of post-discharge care. Glenda? Thank you, Gail. The objectives that we're going to address uh, during this session is strategies to address common breastfeeding issues, the American Academy's pediatrics recommendation on the duration of breastfeeding, and then talk just a little bit about the importance of tracking breastfeeding initiation and duration rates in your practice setting. When you have a new mom and a new dad coming in to your office uh, using you as their primary care provider for their infant, uh, they are seeking rules because this is the biggest job of their life. They want to know that best way to perform every task. They're very frustrated with the conflicting information. They're very vulnerable to judgment. And they see experts as very powerful role models. Their most persistent feeling is a lack of self-confidence. And that's who you have walking into your office, people who don't feel confident in their ability to take care of their babies, particularly if it's their first baby. Just to review, a mother, before she's discharged from the hospital, needs to know how to feed her baby, whether she's breast or bottle feeding. She needs to understand the importance of exclusive breastfeeding if she's a a mother who is breastfeeding, she needs to recognize that those feedings are going well and how to access support and assistance after she goes home from the hospital. And she also needs to be sent home with certain resources. We give our moms everything that we possibly can in writing because we tell them a tremendous amount of information and it's very difficult for mothers to remember everything that's said to them in the hospital. So anything that you can put in writing is to your advantage. They also need telephone numbers and then that support group resource. What are the support groups in the area and how do they uh, how do they get connected with those? So then after discharge from the hospital, well hopefully what will happen? Well what we hope for is a healthy mother and a healthy baby and a happy mom, basically. Uh, but sometimes we have other outcomes. Sometimes they're mother related and sometimes they're infant related. The American Academy of Pediatrics recommends that early office visit within the first three to five days of life or 48 to 72 hours following discharge. And sometimes when a mom comes in, even though it, let's say that this is a pediatric office, they're focused on the baby, they may notice some issues with the mother. And one of the, the primary issues that you might be called upon to make decisions about or to address is mental issues with the mother. It is normal for 80% of all mothers to express that they are having baby blues. And what baby blues looks like is they're happy sometimes, they're down sometimes, they can be tearful about certain things, but then 15 minutes later, they're happy and talking about other things. And so it's kind of an up and down with that baby blues in the first few days following uh, having a new baby, the first few weeks. Postpartum depression, actual depression, affects about 15% of all mothers. Some of those moms will have anxiety or, or postpartum panic disorders. About 10% have that. And then 3 to 5% will have postpartum obsessive compulsive disorder. Postpartum traumatic stress disorder only occurs in about 1 to 6 percent, and it's psychosis, that emergency situation that takes place, that occurs in less than 1 percent. So you can have varying degrees of moms struggling uh, after they take a new baby home from the hospital. The way to assess for that is just to listen for abnormal responses. Is she just kind of dull or disinterested in her baby? Does she seem real irritated, have a flight of ideas? Does she express numerous fears? Is she very, very tearful? Is she expressing a lot of guilt or hopelessness? If you're hearing that, one of the most telling questions that you can ask is, can you fall asleep when you have a chance to? Uh, they might say, I'm having a hard time sleeping because the baby's up so much. Well, if the baby goes to sleep and you lay down for a while, are you able to fall asleep? A mother who is having more severe issues than just the normal postpartum um, ups and downs, the baby blues, that mother will sometimes or many times say no. And if that's the case, then it's our responsibility as healthcare providers when we hear that to say, I think this is something that you'll want to talk to your OB about and refer them back to their OB for care on that. 
if her responses seem strange or unreasonable or outside reality, assume the worst case scenario. Assume that you are looking at psychosis. They usually will have someone with them, instruct them not to leave that mother alone, and make sure that the OB is aware. And many times that's just saying to the person that's with her, you very definitely need to talk to her OB today. I would encourage you to call before you leave the office and tell the OB what's going on. Uh, it does not happen frequently, but when it does, it's important that we act on it. So what are some of the infant-related issues, some of the things that we see going on with babies? Well, the important thing to ask in order to get to what the mother's biggest concern is, is just how is the baby doing? When you ask how is the baby doing, instead of asking specific questions, you open the door for her to tell you what's the top thing on her mind. If you allow her to tell you the top thing that's on her mind, she can then listen to the things that you have to say to her. If you first just start giving her instructions and talking to her about the things that you think should be going on, all she's thinking about is her primary concern. And she's thinking, I've got to remember to ask this, I've got to remember to ask this. And so it's important just to ask that question, well, tell me how the baby's doing. And then to ask specific questions after they've given you their biggest concern. How many times is the baby feeding? How many wet dirt? and dirty diapers is the baby having. And we know that it's normal for babies to feed 8 to 12 times, to have at least one wet diaper for each day of life for the first four days, and then for the first uh, one to three days to have at least one stool a day, on day four to have two stools, and then by the time the baby is five days old, to have at least six to eight wet diapers per 24 hours, and four or more stools per 24 hours, and that the size of the stool does matter. When they say, well, he had six stools, how large is the stool? Is it at least the size of a 50 cent piece in the diaper? And does the baby appear satisfied after feedings? Ask them to describe to you what the baby looks like after they get through feeding. And of course, this is a, a baby who's just got that look of Boy, that feeding just went really well, and I'm very, very satisfied. And then you can ask some other questions. Is your milk in? Do your breasts feel softer after feedings? Are you leaking milk? Are feedings comfortable? Do you have any other questions? And those will help you get to the issues that the mother and the baby are experiencing. So let's talk about a few of those common breastfeeding problems. Here are four things that I think are most commonly seen during that first visit with um, the outpatient care provider. Feeding constantly. Tip, there are typical causes of that. Sometimes it's a hungry baby. Sometimes a baby who is feeding more often than you would expect a baby to feed is having a poor milk exchange or a mother has a poor supply of milk. That, of course, is going to be revealed by the baby's weight. If a baby is feeding very, very frequently uh, and the baby's weight is normal or above normal, then obviously we don't have a hungry baby or a lack of milk supply. Maybe it's a baby with a tummy ache. Maybe it's a mother who's misreading cues. It would, be, it would not be common for a baby to exhibit problems with certain foods in mother's diet during that first visit. But on down the line, if you've got a mother who's telling you after about three to four weeks, my baby just feeds all the time and that baby's gaining more weight than you would expect, then I am suspecting that the baby is having a response to some food that mother's eating that's causing causing some discomfort for the baby that it's interpreting as hunger or that the mother is just misreading cues and she thinks every time the baby uh, starts to suck on its hand, uh, maybe to try and get itself to sleep, she's interpreting that as hunger and overfeeding because she's misreading those cues. So you have to look at management. What is the mom doing? And then what are the weight checks? Is that baby gaining weight? If the baby's not gaining weight, is the mother stopping feedings early because someone's told her that she needs to only breastfeed for 10 minutes on each side? Is she only feeding on a certain schedule? And that's why her baby's not gaining weight well. So you have to look at the management in comparison to the weight um, to see what's going on. Also, these moms sometimes just need to be taught other ways to soothe their babies rather than breastfeeding because sometimes when babies cry, mothers don't understand that it is normal for babies to cry some during every day and that it does not always mean that they are hungry. So they need an understanding of normal infant behavior. The most common reason that mom will begin to supplement or add in other kinds of foods or stop breastfeeding altogether is the fear that her baby is not getting enough milk. And mothers who have that fear and start feeding their babies are good mothers. Good mothers want their babies to be fed. So it's our responsibility as healthcare providers to give her the information that she needs 
not to stop breastfeeding or not to start supplementing unnecessarily or not to add in other foods out of that fear. Our responsibility is to address that fear with her so that she can feel confident that her baby is getting enough milk. And she will know the things to watch for and the baby's weight will be followed closely and it explained to her so that she knows that things are going okay. Here's some of the reasons mothers think their babies are hungry. My baby cries a lot. My baby won't sleep for a long time. Uh, after my baby breastfeeds, it, well, when I'm trying to feed my baby, it's hard to get her settled down and get her to latch on and get her to nurse. She sucks on her finger a lot. Or my baby's really big. Maybe I don't make enough milk for my baby. Or my baby's really small. Maybe I need to supplement because my baby was uh, only weighed six pounds when it was born. Those are reasons that mothers will fear that their babies are not getting enough. And so each one of those will need to be gone over with the mother if that is her fear. Some other reasons they uh, want, they want to feed more frequently than the mother thinks is normal. Uh, the mother tries to hand express the milk and she doesn't get a whole lot or she doesn't feel full before, doesn't feel softer afterwards. She doesn't feel that sensation of letdown or, well, I gave him a bottle and he started, he took it. Those are reasons that mothers will want to supplement. They may indicate a problem. So you have to explore each one of those as well as compare it to the baby's weight and compare it to the management that the mother's doing with breastfeeding, but they are not reliable indicators. It is not reliable to say, okay, your baby wants to feed frequently, so therefore we're going to supplement your baby. If you put that baby on the scale and the baby has gained more weight than is, than is the expected norm for that baby, feeding that baby formula is not going to solve that mother's problem. Here are some reliable indicators that feedings are not going well. After four days, uh, six or more wet diapers in a 24-hour period with pale, diluted urine unless that baby's receiving water supplements. So if you're supplementing a baby with water, they're going to have plenty of urine, but they should be having six or more wet diapers in a 24-hour period uh, by the time they're five days old. They should have three to eight stools in a 24-hour period after day four. After one month, their stooling can be less frequent then, but if they're not having those frequent uh, stools uh, in that first month, then that could be a reliable indicator that the baby's not doing well. Are they alert? Do they have good muscle tone? Do they have healthy skin? Are they consistently gaining weight? That's the most reliable indicator of whether or not a baby is taking in enough, is how much weight is that baby gaining. Here's some of the reasons that mothers don't produce enough milk. Limited removal. A mother who puts her baby on, the sch on a schedule and says, well, I'm going to only feed my baby every three hours. We actually had a mother who called our uh, department and said, my baby can't go as long between feedings as he's supposed to go. And we said, well, how long is your baby supposed to go between feedings? And she said, four hours. My mother-in-law said that my husband could go four hours between feedings. And so uh, my baby is supposed to go four hours between feedings. So she had gotten some information and had really gotten that confused in her mind. And her milk production was low because she was trying to adhere to that four-hour schedule. Uh, so those scheduled feedings, those infrequent scheduled feedings. Sometimes mothers take the advice of feed the baby only 10 minutes on each side and they shorten the feeding more than is necessary for that baby to take in enough milk. Babies are not timed at bottles and they should not be timed at the breast and that old advice still circulates around there sometimes. And then a baby that is just not latching on and nursing effectively that has a poor attachment. Psychologically, sometimes moms can have low milk production because they're just not confident in their ability to breastfeed. They've got a lot of anxiety, and that anxiety causes the release of dopamine, which is a prolactin inhibitor. And that lack of confidence in itself can cause moms to have low milk production. A mother who's overly fatigued, she doesn't have anyone to help her out with anything. Mothers sometimes put too much on themselves. They in getting up with the baby will think, well, I'm awake anyway to feed the baby, so I need to change the baby and get the baby back to bed and not bother other people in the household. Well, if they're very, very tired because their baby is feeding a lot at night, then perhaps they need to get up with the baby, feed the baby, and then hand the baby over to someone else to change the diaper and get the baby back to sleep. In the daytime, are they taking frequent naps if they're able, able to? A feeling of being overwhelmed by the whole thing. 
a mother at home with two or three other children that are under the age of four, uh, that mother might feel overwhelmed and feel like she can't handle everything, just worry and stress. Those are all psychological factors that can cause low milk production. Poor attachment. We've already talked about short, hurried feedings. Baby being stopped too soon or a baby that's premature, a late preterm infant sometimes has a hard time exchanging milk because it just lacks those sucking skills that are necessary to remove milk. It's important to know the normal growth pattern of babies as we make an assessment of whether or not a mother actually has a low production of milk or that a baby is not taking a lot of milk. Some infants are going to lose very little weight and start gaining very quickly. Uh, five to seven percent is considered normal weight loss. So even if a baby gets up to seven percent, that's okay. It is appropriate weight gain for a baby to gain about six ounces per week for the first three to four months, four to five ounces per week for four to six months, and then two to four ounces per week from six to twelve months. In general, they're going to double their birth weight by six months, gain to three times their birth weight by twelve months, and most of the growth charts that are being used today, many of them that are being used, don't reflect breastfeeding versus formula feeding. There are breastfeeding growth charts out there that are available through the CDC. So prevention is the best cure and the Baby Friendly Hospital Initiative has the 10 steps that we've already gone over that help moms and babies get off to a good start. But what if they occur anyway? What if everything was done right and still you've got a baby that's lost an, an, a, uh, an unusual amount of weight uh, or is not gaining weight that it should. Well, if that baby is identified as a failure to thrive baby, it must be medically managed by the physician. If that baby is not a failure to thrive baby, if this is just a low weight gain or uh, an early excessive weight loss that hopefully can be turned around quickly, then you need to address the causes of low milk intake, that exchange and that production of milk. And that's best done by a known referral source who is a person that has skill in lactation care. So what does an outpatient lactation consult look like? Well, when a patient comes in for an outpatient consult, a history is taken on the patient and that history includes Tell me about how feedings go. Tell me about the management of breastfeeding. There's an undressed weight done on the baby so that we can follow those weights and make sure that the baby is gaining weight and it's not dependent on how, much, how many clothes the baby has on when you put the baby on the scales, but a completely undressed weight. Then whatever the baby is going to be fed in is put on the baby, a diaper and many times a t-shirt. And then the mother is assisted with a feeding, with an assessment of how that goes. And then the baby is weighed with nothing being changed from the pre-feed weight. The diaper's not changed if the baby stools or voids because that was inside the mother and um, inside the baby and was it included in the weight uh, during the pre-feed weight. So it shouldn't be taken off of the baby in the post-feed weight. And the baby is weighed in exactly the same circumstance. And then if the feeding is inadequate, let's say that you get a pre and a post feed weight and you determine that a baby is only taken in one ounce and that baby is two weeks old, that's an inadequate amount of milk. And so then the mother uses a pump to determine what her milk supply is to see if it is a milk supply problem or if mother's got plenty of milk, but baby's just not taking the milk, which is a milk exchange problem. And then the physician report is generated and sent to the physician, and then there should be follow-up with that patient to make sure whatever issue was being addressed is being, um, you know, that a positive outcome is, is resulting from that. And if it is not, that then the plan of care is changed to make that positive outcome occur. With general <coughs> management for a lactation consult, you want to establish a weight gain, weight loss pattern, discuss that breastfeeding history, how often, how long, is there pain? Sometimes pain is the hallmark of inadequate milk exchange. If a baby is not latched on correctly and it's causing the mother a lot of pain, then that baby may not be getting enough milk. And then evaluate that feeding, evaluate that milk supply, and offer options for improving feedings. And many times, if it's an inadequate milk supply, triple feeding will be done, which is to feed the baby at the breast, feed the baby supplementation following feeding at the breast, and then pump to get milk for the next time that you supplement, or to encourage more milk production by trying to remove more milk from the breast than the feeding got. 
Uh, sometimes galactagogues, and that's medication that can be used to increase mother's milk production, is indicated. Not most of the time. Most of the time it's a management issue. It is not a physical issue that can be addressed with medication. But every once in a while you'll have a mom who will have abnormally low prolactin levels, and a galactagogue is indicated. But you've got to have those lab tests to, to show that, and then a follow-up weight check. If you've got a mom that comes in who is having nipple uh, pain or some nipple damage, there are two types of pain that you'll hear about in the office uh, when you say, is breastfeeding comfortable? Uh, ask this question. Well, tell me about that pain. Does it decrease after the baby latches on? And if they say, well, yeah, it only lasts for about 30 or 45 seconds, less than a minute, and then it goes away, then that's a normal type of discomfort that's usually going to go after a few days or a week or two. If the pain is during the entire feeding, then that pain is showing that there is nipple damage taking place and skin breakdown can be occurring. And usually that's a position or a latch problem which is best managed with hands-on assistance. The treatment for that might be just simply correcting the position in latch and then using lanolin or hydrogel to treat that. Uh, there are also some nipple creams out there. There's an over-the-counter nipple cream that the mother can mix up her se herself that is very, very helpful. Sometimes the nipple is helpful with nipple damage or pain, but should only be used with a care provider that knows how to use and follow up with that. And then pumping, if latch is too painful, to help heal the nipples and then to allow the mother to go back to breastfeeding because uh, she has healed up enough that it's no longer painful, and then to address whatever problem with the latch was occurring. Another thing that you might hear when a mother comes back in for that early visit is, I am so full. What do I do about all of this fullness? Well, prevention is the best cure. Don't skip those feedings at night. Don't supplement. And do some frequent feedings or do frequent feedings. But sometimes mothers do get engorged. Sometimes they have not done those preventative measures, and they do. The most common cause is infrequent or poor feedings. And the usual course of it is that the breast is going to fill to capacity. There's going to be pressure in the milk duct that's going to push the milk out of the milk ducts that's filling up those milk ducts beyond their capacity to hold it and the breast is going to respond to that milk that's in the breast tissue in general by swelling. It's an inflammatory response that the breast has and it will usually last about two to three days. The treatment for that is for mom to improve her nipple shape in order to help the baby get latched on because your baby's going to be your best pump during engorgement. And if you can get the baby to latch on and do a good job with emptying, that's going to go a long with, way with helping to get rid of the engorgement. If a mother's not able to get her baby to latch on, then she should, can pump during engorgement and she should pump with a good quality pump at the fastest speed at the lowest strength. That's the most uh, that's the most helpful pumping to do if a mom is engorged. She can use limited heat before, only like three to five minutes is all. She can use ice afterwards for about 30 minutes, about three times a day. But the only evidence-based um, the only evidence-based treatment for engorgement that actually shows improvement is the use of uh, anti-inflammatories, non-steroid steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs uh, like Advil or ibuprofen. Those things will help with engorgement if a mother gets on that protocol for two or three days as she works through engorgement. So many times what we'll tell her is just to continue taking what she was taking in the hospital for discomfort, to continue that if that's okay with her physician. Here's a mom who's severely engorged, and she has not only generalized engorgement in her breast, she also has a real engorgement. And you can see from the shininess of her real that that is very, very tight. And a baby would have a very difficult time latching onto that and pulling that nipple to the back of their mouth where it needs to be in order to adequately remove milk from the breast. So it's important to try and get a handle on severe engorgement and hopefully prevent it, but when it does occur, her to use the things that we talked about to help uh, get rid of it. If you've got severe encouragement, it may also indicate an inadequate milk exchange. So ask questions about the baby. Uh, if the mom's right there in the office, she might have called and asked these questions over the phone. So you'll want to ask these questions over the phone. If she's right there in the office, of course, you have the 
opportunity to weigh the baby and see what the baby is doing. But uh, if you're talking over the phone, make sure that all the signs are there that the baby is getting plenty to eat. And if they're not, have them come in for a weight check because sometimes severe engorgement uh, is uh, causing the baby not to get enough milk. Nipple pain and engorgement can be that red flag and they can also lead to a decrease in milk supply. Here's some less common breastfeeding issues. Uh, there's kind of an 80-20 rule with moms and babies. 80% of all moms and babies will do well with breastfeeding. 20% will have significant problems that required skilled assistance. And when I say 80%, I mean those who are given the appropriate pro motion protection and support that we've talked about. And the other 20%, no matter what you do, are still going to have problems with breastfeeding. And so they may not result in the perfect outcome. So what are some of those? Well, we don't have all the answers, but we are learning more all the time. And there are no guarantees. As far as premature infants are concerned, um, you know, we are all aware that these babies many times are not able to go to the breast and breastfeed effectively depending on how preterm they are. But we also know that because of the benefits of human milk, all infants should receive human milk. And the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends that. Mother's own milk is the preferred milk and it should be the primary diet, but if it is not available, if her milk is not available, pasteurized human don donor milk should be used. And that's from the American Academy section on breastfeeding, uh, breastfeeding and the use of human milk that was published in pediatrics in 2012. So we don't have the suggestion that uh, pasteurized human donor milk be used if mom's milk is not available. We, s we have the um, edict that it should be used. It says in that statement, pasteurized donor milk should be used. So we are called upon, if we are following the recommendation of the pediatrics, to have this available for our premature babies. We also know from a Cochrane database review in 2003, uh, what they did was look at all of the literature that was related to human milk feedings and skin-to-skin -skin care and what they said, one of their conclusions was skin-to-skin -skin and human milk feedings are preventative medicine for premature babies. So they're not only nutrition for the premature baby, they actually help to prevent medical issues. And of course, the most common medical issue is ne necrotizing enterocolitis which is a devastating diagnosis for uh, many babies in the intensive care unit. In the outpatient setting, the American the uh, Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine Protocol number 12 talks about transitioning that breastfeeding, uh, breast milk fed premature infant from the neonatal care intensive care unit to home. Uh, that protocol is currently under revision. There is an old 2005 protocol and they'll have the new one up soon. But it tells us the things that we need to do in the outpatient setting. So I'm going to go over the things that were in the 2005 protocol, but do know that that one is being, um, is being updated. The average gestational age at discharge from the intensive care unit is 35 to 36 weeks. So if you have in your practice a baby coming home from the intensive care unit, it's probably going to be there. It's probably going to weigh between about four to six pounds. And the key principles when you're discharge planning with these babies and then caring for these babies on an outpatient basis is that you cannot look at the same things that you look at with a term infant and use those as indicators for a preterm infant. In other words, you cannot look at the urine and stool output with a preterm infant and say that that's the same thing that a term infant should have on discharge from a hospital. A preterm infant's not going to stool perhaps as much because that baby's two or three months old now. Mother's milk has already changed and so that baby's not having the frequent stools that a term infant will have once they get home from the hospital. Preterm infants may not consistently demand to be fed. They might need for someone to still set a clock and get them up about every three hours to feed. And in general they should not be awakened more than every three hours because they need that time to repair and grow. So if they are sleeping three hours and gaining weight well, it is not necessary to wake those babies up any more often than every three hours. And then mothers of preterm infants are not reassured by healthcare providers that say, well, when you get home, just do the best that you can. They need guidelines on what to do. And so we have those guidelines. Number one, they need to continue any feeding strategies that worked in the hospital. So Milk transfer must be monitored regularly because it was monitored regularly in the hospital. If a mother is breastfeeding her baby and combining that with other feedings, then she needs to have frequent weight checks after that baby is home from the hospital until it is at term corrected age, until it is at least at 40 weeks gestation. Test weights can be done with that baby where you weigh the baby before, 
feed the baby, weigh the baby after, and that will tell the mother how much the baby is taking in. Now there are specific scales that do that. You can't just do that on the bathroom scales. But there are specific scales that are designed for that, that can be rented by moms, so that they can do these test rates and make sure that the intake is adequate on these babies. And then any change in strategy must be monitored and evaluated. Let's say that a mother feels that her baby's really breastfeeding well. And she is at home and she is saying, I want to stop supplementing my baby because I think my baby's doing extremely well. Do a weight check prior to stopping supplementation and then do a weight check within two to three days after so stopping supplementation so that you are sure that changing that strategy is that baby is continuing to be fed well. When they first get home from the hospital, moms many times find if they have a premature infant that they need to continue to pump at least three times a day to help maintain a good production of milk for about a month or two after discharge from the hospital. And many of them during that first month or so will triple feed. They will feed the baby at the breast, they will provide supplement for the baby, and then they'll pump right after they supplement. Those moms, many times as they are decreasing that supplement because baby's beginning to take less supplement, they'll alternate between feeding and supplementing, one feeding, and then the next time feed and pump, and then the next time feed and supplement, and the next time feed and pump. And they'll use that milk that they've pumped for the next feeding time supplementation, and that gives that baby just the extra that they need to continue to grow well. And then we talked about the triple feedings and what that looks like. Uh, they will go from part-time, many times, breastfeeding to full-time breastfeeding during the first week. It's not surprising if that baby is taking about one-third of their feedings at the breast and two-thirds from the bottle. By the time they're at four weeks, it's not surprising for those babies to be taking most of their feeding at the breast and maybe like a third of their feedings from a bottle. The ultimate goal is full direct breastfeeding when you can possibly help that mother get there. So that follow-up includes weekly weight checks until term corrected age, more often weight checks if mom's decreasing supplementation, and it's not appropriate to just use output as that indicator of adequate intake for these babies. And then the rental scales that we talked about are also a good part of that discharge planning. For the late preterm infant, this is also a special baby uh, that's not the average baby in your care, but a baby that you might see every once in a while. They do have needs that are not as, uh, not as, um, I don't even want to call them severe, but not as involved as the true preterm infant, but they are not your term infant either. And the three biggest needs that a late preterm infant has is number one, to make sure that that baby's being fed, fed well, because sometimes they have a problem with intake, to make sure that that baby's being kept warm, and to monitor that baby's output in the first few days. So here's the instructions that we give our moms in terms of here's what you do with a breastfeeding baby. And we talk about it in terms of the baby talking to the mom. Feed me every two to three hours. Feed me at two hours if I'm awake and exhibiting hunger cues. Feed me at three hours if I have not awakened by then. Uh, you should express milk after feeding, particularly if the feeding is not a stellar feeding. Uh, if the feeding is going well, then mom does not have to take that milk and feed that milk to the baby, but she if the feeding is not going well, she should take that milk and feed that milk to the baby, either by spoon or soft cup feeder, ideally, or a bottle if she uh, does not have you know, someone that can follow up with her on those other kind of feeding methods. She needs to hold that baby skin to skin several times a day. And I had a patient one time who had a late preterm infant that I was discharging from the hospital, and I said to the mother, it's important to continue skin-to-skin -skin care just like you've been doing here in the hospital. And she turned to her husband and said, see, I told you I could hold him after I get home from the hospital. And what had happened is that someone had told that mother, maybe the father, maybe someone else that the husband had overheard, uh, you shouldn't hold the baby so much, you're spoiling the baby. And so giving them the permission and the instruction to do that is very important, particularly with these late preterm infants, to always dress those babies in one layer more than the mother has on. So if they are uh, in one layer of clothing to have a blanket on the baby, if they are not going to have a blanket on them and mom has on one layer of clothing, then they should have on two layers of clothing, a little t-shirt, maybe, maybe double pants, and then to keep the room temperature between uh, 72 and 74 degrees. 
Their output is the same as what we talked about earlier. Uh, you can depend on their, their output as an indicator. So one wet and one stool day one, two wets and one stool day two, three wets and one stool day three, four wets and two stools day four, and at least six wets and four stools on day five. And mom should be taught that. Here's another thing that sometimes you'll see in the outpatient setting. Sometimes it will have been caught in the hospital, but sometimes you will not see it until the mother gets to your office. And it's a short frenulum. And here's nipple trauma that's associated with a short frenulum. A short frenulum and any other type of anatomical variation warrants a second look. When a mother is having a problem with breastfeeding, such as in this picture, she's having a problem with nipple tenderness, Many times that is the um, symptom of the problem. It is not the problem. So nipple tenderness is not the actual problem. The baby's short frenulum is the actual problem. So when you've got a baby that is having a breastfeeding problem, and let's say that it is a short frenulum and that baby does have its frenulum clipped and the uh, feeding problem goes away, the two most common feeding problems that you'll see with a short frenulum is inadequate weight gain or severe nipple tenderness in the mom. If that frenulum is clipped and those problems go away, then you cured the problem. It wasn't the inadequate weight gain and it wasn't the nipple tenderness, it was the short frenulum the baby had. But let's say that you don't have a short frenulum and that baby's having feeding problems and you can't determine why mom's got plenty of milk but the baby can't exchange the milk. Uh, mother's had pre and post weights done where she's done a pre and post weight, the baby took in very little, looked like it was breastfeeding well and then they pumped and found the mother had four ounces of milk left and the baby had only taken one ounce of milk and it's three weeks old and that baby's continuing to have those kind of problems. That may indicate a referral to a qualified speech pathologist or to an OT to evaluate what might be going on with that baby because they have skills many times that can take a look at that anatomical variation, identify what it is, and actually do early intervention for that. They might not be able to solve the breastfeeding issue because some of those problems require long-term care, but many times they can help early intervention so that the problem is not only identified at three and four when that baby's having speech problems that go along with that. Here's some questions that you might need to answer in your office. How long should I breastfeed my baby? Well, we've already talked about this. We don't have to give our opinion about it. We can give the American Academy statement on it that they recommend exclusive breastfeeding for about six months with the addition of foods for a year and as long thereafter as mutually desired by the mother or the infant. There is no specific age when breastfeeding is no longer important. It is always good nutrition. And what I laugh and say all the time is it never turns to Kool-Aid. It has always got those antibiotics in it, it is always the perfect nutrition for that baby, and it always offers protection from illnesses. Mothers may need help in overcoming pressure to stop. They might need help in overcoming the pressure that they feel when they're going back to work. You might help them develop a plan. Sometimes mothers can continue to breastfeed in the morning and afternoon at night and drop their feeding times in the daytime. If they uh, are unable to pump at work, sometimes they don't know that you can just partially breastfeed. Uh, sometimes they've got friends or family that are caught Causing an issue. And I just recently read a study that said the primary supporter that will have an impact on breastfeeding duration is that person's partner, is their support person, the person who is with them most often, the dad or their significant other that's in their life. So it's important when they come in for visits that you educate that family member also so that they can be the support that they need and not pressure that mother to stop and make those recommendations aloud to these family members so that they have heard the same thing too. And then sometimes it's just the overall culture around that mother. And one of the things that can help with the overall culture is support groups, that continuing education that is appropriate for adult learners because mothers can ask questions when they go to support groups from experienced moms or from people who are uh, facilitating the group that have experience and information about breastfeeding and they can ask questions on a need to know basis. That's what helps to change a culture. When you can get a mother in a group, then that starts to change the mother's culture. Sometimes the mothers that she meets in a support group are the only mothers that she has ever known that are breastfeeding babies or that have breastfed a baby. And so it's important to help change her culture if her culture is not a breastfeeding culture by hooking her up with support groups. 
uh, because that does help to change that. And it also has been shown to very definitely increase duration rates in mothers. So this is what our support groups look like. We, we have support groups through our facility, and many of the hospitals in Alabama are beginning to develop support groups. And it's just what we call a circle of friends. You sit around in a circle many times on the floor with your babies, and you talk to other moms. And you get a group of mothers together like this, and most of the time somebody in that group has a reasonable uh, a solution to an issue that a mother's another, another mother's having, something that she's gone through. Uh, maybe the uh, if there's a lactation consultant there that's leading that group or a peer support uh, person, maybe that person can answer those questions. But somebody in that group can help that mother out with that issue. Mothers spend more time facing developmental issues than any other issues combined. Then they face, how do I take my baby's temperature? Or what do I do if my baby you know, has this symptom or that symptom? They face developmental issues more than anything else. And many times we're not as effective in addressing those issues as a group of other new mothers are in addressing that. Here's some of the things that are talked about commonly in support groups. Uh, if my baby's not sleeping, how about yours? And sometimes just knowing that somebody else's baby is not sleeping also and it's four months old is a comfort enough to that mother to help her continue to breastfeed her baby instead of giving up because everybody she knows who has their baby on formula, they might all be sleeping all night long. Uh, what do I do about teething, biting, starting solids? You know, I've got a two-year-old that's still nursing and I'm about to deliver. Do people ever breastfeed two babies at one time? Uh, what do you do? What did your doctor say about birth control? What do you do about if your baby refuses to nurse? All of those kind of issues are issues that moms face that can be answered many times in support groups. And then also that support group assist mothers in feeling more comfortable with breastfeeding their babies in front of other people. Babies don't always want to feed only in private. Mothers are going to be in circumstances when they are with their babies and they are with other people and they need to breastfeed their babies. And they can gain some level of comfort by just being with an other, another group of mothers who feel more comfortable with that so perhaps they can take that out with them and help to change our entire culture and its friendliness towards breastfeeding. Here's a mom who was weighing her baby at one of the support groups, uh, and that weighing sometimes is very important to those mothers. When they see their baby growing, then they gain that confidence that they might not have. Remember I said one of the most prevalent feelings that they have is a lack of self-confidence. Well, following a weight weekly at a support group is a huge confidence builder as they see their baby grow. Talking to other women who are breastfeeding, seeing other mothers breastfeed their babies, that's a huge confidence builder in what I I'm doing is the right thing for my baby and other people think so too uh, and you know just being able to be there and be around other people uh, I said that weighing babies is an important thing this baby even knew it didn't need to be weighed but this mother came every week to support group and weighed her baby every week and incidentally we did have permission from all of these mothers to show their pictures uh, so now she's ready She's ready to wean, and she says, well, how do I wean my baby? Uh, and she's in your, in, her, in your office. She's not in the support group. She's asking you as the primary care provider. Well, there's two ways to wean. One is baby-led weaning, and if you let a baby wean itself, it will generally wean between 18 and 36 months. Some mothers are not willing to breastfeed that long, and so that's called mother-led weaning when they decide that they are ready to uh, wean. Uh, we call it don't ask, don't refuse. If you want to start trying, just don't offer to breastfeed the baby but don't refuse to breastfeed the baby and many times that's all that it takes try to be absent at the time the baby's the most likely to want to nurse so if they most likely nurse at about two o'clock in the afternoon because they're going down for a nap have somebody else put them down for a nap at two o'clock in the afternoon and you not be there to nurse the baby at that time for a few days in a row offer other activities or snacks for those feeding times uh, you know, if they kind of are getting ready to try and you know that they normally breastfeed at this time or they're acting like they might be about to ask to breastfeed, then very hurriedly find their favorite thing to eat and drink and offer that to them as a snack. But whatever moms should do, they should wean lovingly with those babies. So what's next? Well, the next thing that's important for 
care providers is to track their data on initiation and duration in their office setting. They should know what their mothers are doing as far as breastfeeding is concerned. And the reason for doing that is not a punitive reason. It's not to say, oh, your office is not as good as this office or to publicly report that data or anything like that. It is to find out what your challenges are. So that if you have a 90% initiation rate, but by the time the babies in your practice are at six weeks, only 10% of them are breastfeeding, then you need to be looking at what's going on with these mothers at what point in time that's causing them to stop breastfeeding in that first six weeks and start trying to identify ways that you can support these mothers through that, to look back and see what's going on and track down. Ask the mothers who you're um, asking that have weaned their babies, tell me what led to your weaning. I'm, I'm trying to get more information how we can help moms breastfeed longer. Tell me what led to your weaning. So that's the only way to do that is to know what your challenges are. That's the end of part four. Okay, I think maybe we have time for one short, maybe two short questions there. Um, for, for the facilities out there who feel like they want to increase their breastfeeding rates, would you consider implementation of skin to skin to be one of the most appropriate things for them to do? I think it's probably the most important thing for them to do. And when we started working on our uh, infant care practices, when we got back our first CDC MPINC survey report, the very first thing that we worked on was skin-to-skin -skin care because we felt like that was the first most important thing that you could do. You can follow other things, you know, you can work on the other things following that, but if you want a starting point and you're not doing skin-to-skin, skin-to-skin is absolutely the first thing you should do. Very good. And we do have skin-to-skin uh, -skin policies that are available from some of the facilities that are willing mm -hmm. to share those. Anyone interested could contact me at my email address. We do have one question from the phone. We do. We have a call from Tennessee. Go ahead with your question. Good afternoon. Hello. Go ahead with your question, please. Uh, hello. I am a peer counselor. And so it has been awesome to see the chain of command and the support that our moms should be getting um, directly after, well, before birth and directly afterwards. Um, as a peer counselor, do you feel that it is necessary for us to receive um, additional training, such as a certified lactation um, consultant um, designation? That way we are in step with being able to offer the support uh, to our moms. I think any education that you get is invaluable to these moms, that if you can get education from a reliable source that provides reliable information, that you are going to be able to better and better help your moms. As far as peer counselors becoming certified, that is and certified by the Certified uh, Lactation Counselor Program or through the International Board of Lactation Consultant Examiners. That is an individual decision that each peer counselor has to make as far as whether or not she wants to invest in that. But yes, I think as a peer counselor, I think as anyone who has any contact with mothers at all, it's our responsibility to do continuing education, that we strive to keep up with what's going on in the literature and we strive to attend education sessions that are going to provide good quality information so that the care and the information that we give to moms is quality and not just opinion based. Right. Okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you for your timely question here. <laughs> we are right at, out of time for our webinar and we do appreciate you uh, being a part of our webinar and would like to also let you know that this webinar is available and about two days at the website that we are on now at Alabama, oh, I'm sorry, www.adph slash ALPHTN. About two days check and we'll be there. Again, we thank you so much uh, for improving your knowledge on breastfeeding where we can help our mothers and babies in our state. Thank you.